In the ancient land of Xerxes lived a man simply known as 23, the 23rd slave of the most prestigious royal house in the land. 23 did not want for much. Despite being confined, he was satisfied with his position and lived out his days performing menial tasks. He held some vague dreams about starting a family, but never really thought it possible. However, one day, he came into contact with a strange creature named Homunculus, or the Dwarf in the Flask. The Dwarf was the result of an experiment that required some of 23's blood in order to provide it with sustainable life, which it appreciated. In return, this being provided 23 with a name, Von Hohenheim. The Homunculus taught Hohenheim a wealth of things and provided him with an education, which allowed him to slowly gain status and influence and climb the ranks in Xerxes. And this all allowed Hohenheim to dream a little, to have ambition, and most importantly, to desire to have a family. However, the dwarf in the flask also had grand ambitions that coincided with the death of the people of Xerxes. All of them except for Hohenheim, whom he granted immortality and an endless life out of gratitude for providing it with life. This immortality was granted thanks in part to the endless souls that Hohenheim forcibly consumed in this ritual, and through Hohenheim's subsequent opposition and compensation, this event formed the crux of the enigmatic character that is so fundamentally tied to the main messages of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. The Dwarf did a many terrible things, but at a base level, it is ironically the reason that the traits that characterized Hohenheim in the years to come, a desire for connection and family, a resolve to protect what he cherishes and redeem his sins, are so ingrained in his psyche. Such a traumatic event would naturally give someone a sense of focus and perspective in life, and through making Hohenheim something akin to a grounded god, the dwarf imbued him with a true sense of purpose that would slowly materialize over the coming years into a genuine conviction. The most minute specifics of Hohenheim's life are not shared, at least to my knowledge, but the important thing that is made clear is that as a young man, he was a slave with little to no meaningful connections and no real desires, apart from that abstract dream. But after a glimpse, after a little taste of what you've been missing, the human heart desires more. Hohenheim grew to appreciate life much more after moving up in the world, appreciating connection and joy and fulfillment. And that is why he is so torn up after this event. Without that taste, I seriously doubt that he would have been this affected, or at the very least, not traumatized to the same extent. Regardless, after this catastrophe, the homunculus left Hohenheim to his grief, as the latter was forced to constantly hear the screams and cries of the people he consumed. But empathetic and compassionate as he was, he learned to listen and communicate and understand those souls, all 536,329 of them, their motivations, their names and pleas. Partly due to them, Hohenheim was able to learn Xingyi's medicine and use it to help people in the West, and after years and years of learning of the world, applying his trade and connecting with these souls, he came into contact with a young woman in Rizambul and fell in love. Trisha Elric accepted him wholeheartedly and never once thought of him as a terrible person after learning of his life, and eventually, they started a life and family together after her insistence that Hohenheim deserved a true life of his own, one where he could genuinely be happy and not constantly pining for redemption. This concept was welcoming, but also a difficult thing for Hohenheim to get used to. Having lived as what he viewed as an immortal monster for so long, bearing so many sins, his self-worth was very low and that sort of life was something that he desired but never truly felt that he would be able to grasp for himself. While he valued it very much, the concept of connection to anyone apart from the souls in his body was quite foreign to Hohenheim, and being a parent did not come easy. He was simply awkward and uncomfortable a lot of the time, but it's totally understandable given that he had received such little love throughout his life and was thus unfamiliar with expressing it. But perhaps the foremost reason behind his hesitancy was how fearful he was of making connections as an immortal, due to how scary it could be to form close relationships with people, only to live to see every one of them die. 
All of these things were very substantial factors in Hohenheim's demeanor, and as such, he simply didn't know how to express love and connect properly. But Trisha and his sons slowly showed him how meaningful family was regardless of this, and despite his awkwardness, he was happy. He was loved, and he loved. It was all he ever wanted, and he realized this. Yet, his immortality was a constant factor in his mentality, and he saw it as a curse that made him a monster, made him fearful of… everything. It's something that put him at constant odds with his feelings. During all of his happy times with Trisha, Ed, and Al, he simultaneously felt an immense grief and sadness because he realized what he would be leaving behind when they were all gone. He has also been shown to be uncomfortable touching his sons, due to believing himself to be an unworthy wretch that may pass on this curse of immortality to them. So despite his love, he cared for them in a detached way rather than a nurturing one. Eventually, Hohenheim worked up the resolve to find the answer to getting rid of his immortality, to make things better for himself and his family through allowing him to finally live life with sincerity and abandon. However, his research into this coincided with a discovery that the homunculus, who had now become father, was planning to destroy a mistress with a nationwide transmutation circle. And so, this brought up a new feeling of fear. He knew that were father's plans to be carried out, all of this, his family, a mistress, and everything he held dear, would all be for naught, and it would all be cut short. He wouldn't have to worry about seeing his family growing old and dying, because they would be snuffed out before that could ever happen. And all of this put him on a different plane from the rest of the world. With his knowledge and immortality, Hohenheim had a unique responsibility to stop father and an endeavor to become mortal again if possible. So to prevent this, he had to leave everything behind that made him fulfilled and take on this burden, promising to Trisha in parting that they would be able to grow old together. In reflection many years later, Ed would recall seeing Hohenheim leave for the final time and witnessing what he viewed as a cold look in his eye. But in reality, Hohenheim was just trying not to cry. This started a 10 year disappearance, during which Hohenheim's absence was very much felt. Not only did Trisha deeply miss him, but his leave coincided with both her death and his son subsequently performing human transmutation and losing so much. It is likely that him being present may have helped with Trisha's illness, or prevented Ed and Al from being so rash, or even just provided the two with support after their failed attempt to bring their mother back. As a result, this caused a festering hatred in Ed directed towards Hohenheim for seemingly abandoning them, and it led to Hohenheim hating himself for feeling as if Ed was somewhat correct, even if any choice he made would have seemed like a bad one in retrospect, with loved ones dying either way. It was a difficult situation for him to be put in, but even still, he resolved to make up for all of this by figuring out how to stop father's plan, viewing himself as the catalyst for all of this misery, and for any potential future misery should he fail. Yet I must stress that Hohenheim is far from a one-dimensional personality, despite the crux of his character being someone full of self-blame, hell-bent on putting things right. He's often quite silly and humorous, and has learned to live life with a smile, as Trisha would have wanted for him. He's also very capable of being genuinely as stern and harsh as Ed's unreliable memories viewed him as being, calling his children out for being childish for burning their house down. This was very likely something that he said in pain, after hearing of Trisha's fate and of everything that transpired, but regardless, it's important to note that the broad resonance of his character doesn't accurately capture everything about the man. However, at his core, he is still very much set on salvation and atonement. He takes responsibility for making the better of two bad choices, accepting the brunt of Ed's frustration and pain, and from that point on, he works with him, Al, and the rest of their gang. The fate of the world never really left Hohenheim's sights thanks to his resolve, but as one would expect, his sons were of even greater import. He spends the majority of his time in the story trying to right his wrongs and redeem himself, for bringing father into the world, and most importantly of all, for leaving Ed and Al. He is constantly doing his utmost to protect them in times where they're in danger, trying to make up for lost time in a sense. 
because here, and in the past, he just wanted to be a loving person, and through his actions, he can finally communicate that. Hohenheim was never really great with words, so through these acts of protection and defiance, he's finally able to be whole through expressing what he feels to his boys. And being men of action themselves, Al, and especially Ed, are able to see this crystal clear. I think that these efforts and motivations are an encapsulation of how and why Hohenheim and Father foil one another. While the two share a similarity in the sense that they both desired a life greater than the one that they had been given, they diverge in almost every conceivable way, apart from appearance. Father was full of pride and wanted everything, but Hohenheim just wanted… something. Something resembling a life. As time went on, Father desired immortality and perfection and a grand existence to satisfy his ego, while Hohenheim just wanted a quiet existence to spend with loving family, and his only small acts of desire came when he sought a life for himself beyond that of a slave, when he wanted to destroy Father to save the world, and when he realized that he simply wished to live a little longer to spend some time with his sons. Father spurned humanity despite being so very human, attempting to get rid of his vulnerability, and that was a big reason for his downfall. But Hohenheim embraced his humanity and learned to love it, and that was a big part of the reason that he was able to salvage so much meaning from a life that could have been void of… anything. And it all comes together for him in a moment of true pain, after he offers his life to Ed in order to save Al. Finally being able to find the right words, Hohenheim says that he does this simply because he's their dad. He wants to finally act like a proper father, and he wants them to be safe and happy. But in response, Ed angrily chews him out for even considering the idea, and calls him a rotten father. And in doing so, in using that word, he accepts Hohenheim's role in his life for the first time since his departure. While Ed's words may have seemed condemning and harsh out of context, they are a true representation of Hohenheim finally achieving what he set out to do, properly expressing his love, becoming completely whole and human, and redeeming himself to those who matter most to him. From an apathetic slave, to a lost soul, to a tortured wanderer, and finally, to a true father. Hohenheim learned about himself, about the world, and about others every step of the way, and slowly came to appreciate the strength and meaning of love and connection. Alone, any human would seem insignificant and weak, but together, we can find that purpose and we can do the improbable. Thanks to Trisha and his sons, Hohenheim was able to understand the beauty of being human, of finding solace from within the deepest darkness, and of finding significance from the seemingly insignificant. We will change. Because we can change. I know it. We may be weak, but we just have to be. If not, then we wouldn't have any reason to grow, to get strong. Through embracing the double-edged nature of humanity and accepting everything, Hohenheim reflects on his life and realizes that in spite of all of the pain and suffering, it was one of utmost value and one that he greatly appreciated. An equivalent exchange. And he can finally pass on to join his beloved, ironically happy with the regret of leaving such joy behind. But his ideals, resolve, and life will be carried forward through the ones he sacrificed so much to protect, and we can see this through the contrast between the iconic photo of Hohenheim crying with his family, and the ones of Ed that were shown in the final minutes of the story. And this is not to downplay his love for Alphonse whatsoever, but the contrast is just more apt when comparing him to his older son. With Hohenheim, we see a devastated, regretful man, crying because he knows that it's unlikely that he will be able to live a peaceful, loving life with his family. Something that he ended up being correct about, yet something that didn't stop him from finding value in life anyway. And then, 
we see a brimming, joyful Edward, a spitting image of Hohenheim, gleefully living in the moment with his family, loving his work, and overall just being able to live in the way he desires. It's everything that a father would ever want for his son, and it's a true representation of Hohenheim's legacy, an advocation and appreciation of the joys of love and humanity. Hello, Tricia. I'm home. So get this, Ed actually called me his father. Although he did preface it with rotten. Living through all of these endless years, I always felt like I'd been struck with a curse. But then I found you and we had our sons, and I suddenly felt blessed, grateful for the life I had. I've had a fulfilling life. Thanks to you, it's been enough. Thank you, Trisha. But now, believe it or not, I actually want to keep on living. I guess I'm pretty hopeless, aren't I? Thanks very much for watching, and I'd just like to give a big thank you to Boomslank for sponsoring this video. Boomslank is an anime lifestyle brand run by three brothers in Raleigh, North Carolina. All Boomslank merchandise is based on original anime artwork, and all of it is pretty damn awesome. A link to their website will be in the description, where you can use the coupon code ALEXANDER15, don't forget the X, to get a 15% discount on any purchases you may make. Be sure to check their stuff out, and as always, and once again, many thanks for watching.